So, welcome to this lesson and today we will speak about Android and so the goal of this lesson is to learn how to develop simple, very simple mobile applications in Android. Uh, this is only a very quick introduction to the framework and we will cover only the main topics of, of the framework. So if you need more information, you can use uh, the online documentation um, because uh, we have no time to cover all the specific details of the framework. Um, so this is the summary of our lesson. Uh, we will start with a short history of the of the Android framework and then we will see some details about the platform and the architecture uh, of the framework and then we will try to uh, start developing some uh, initial uh, exercises. So let's start with the Android history. Android was originally created by Andy Rubin and uh, the early intention of the company were to develop um, an advanced operating operating system for digital cameras but then the company uh, decided that the market for cameras was not large enough and they started to develop Android as an operating system for mobile devices um, Android was then acquired by Google in 2005 uh, and today is one of the most common operating system uh, for mobile devices Um, and also each month uh, almost 2 billion of applications are downloaded from the Google Play Store and so if you want to develop uh, a mobile application for your project for example Android is probably the best choice and from uh, 2007 different Android versions have been released the current version is the uh, 9 that introduce um, many different changes but as you can see in the slide uh, many different devices still continue to use previous version of Android and so if you want to develop a mobile application now uh, you should also try to maintain compatibility with uh, the older versions so let's speak about the Android platform um, Android is an open source software stack for a wide range of mobile devices and corresponding uh, and it is also a corresponding open source project led by Google and uh, so Android is a platform and this means that it's not just an operating system but is an ecosystem of different actors such as the, the set of uh, development tools for creating mobile applications and so on Development tools are free and you can develop mobile applications mostly in Java. You can also write code in C++ if you need uh, high performance, but I think that the most common programming language for Android is Java. So how many of you already know how to program in Java? Okay, this is a good news. Uh, but I think that for our simple examples, uh, also who is not uh, able to program in Java will be able to let's say develop some basic Android applications so differently from from other ecosystems such as iOS there is no distinction in Android between uh, native and third-party mobile applications and everything is pluggable and customizable um, However, in the latest versions of Android, some restrictions have been put, mainly for security purposes, and therefore there are part of the phone that are now blocked, typically by the phone manufacturers. Um, all the applications can use the same software development kit that you can download for free, and all the applications can access the underlying hardware. For using the hardware, however, you need the user permission. Okay, and this is uh, the core point of Android. So do you want to take a photo with your application? You must ask the user the permission for using the camera. Do you want to get the current location of the user? You can, but you must ask the user the permission for using the GPS and so on. 
So just a few words about Java. One design goal of Java is portability, which means that programs written in Java uh, must run similarly on any combination of hardware and operating systems. And this is achieved by compiling the Java language code to an intermediate representation named Java bytecode. And Java bytecode are, an are, uh, um, are specific machine code, but they are intended to be executed by a virtual machine written specifically for the, the hardware that hosts the code. Okay, let's go back to Android and in particular to its architecture. Android is an innovative operating system and it is actually a stack of components. And besides the operating system, Android includes a software platform for creating applications and games. And it includes uh, also a set of minimal applications whose feature features uh, can be used in any other application. So for example, do you need to, I don't know, open a web page? You can just invoke the existing browser and then come back to your application. Do you need to send an email? You don't need to develop a custom email application. You can simply use the built-in one. Android was designed to be robust because it is based on the Linux system kernel and all the applications uh, runs in their own process. And inside each process, there is an instance of a virtual machine that executes the Java code. So the figure shows the overall architecture of the Android uh, platform. Inside the kernel, the first level of the figure, you have all the functionality that uh, a typical kernel performs. So you have memory management, you have task scheduling, uh, uh, inter-process communication, network management, and so on and so forth. Then there is the hardware abstraction layer that is used to isolate the actual hardware on which the operating system runs so that you don't get crazy about dealing with specific hardware, hardware components. And it consists of multiple library, libraries that um, implement interfaces for each specific hardware hardware component. And to execute Java code on the real hardware, Android don't use the original Java virtual machine, but it implements a custom virtual machine named Art. Uh, the Android runtime block is therefore used to run multiple Art virtual machine, one for each running application. So there is uh, one Art for each application on your phone. The native libraries are mainly developed in C and C++ and they provide high level functionality to be used by the upper layers. They include open source and well-known libraries such as SQLite, libraries to play and record audio and video and so on. On top of the Android runtime block and the native libraries, there is the Android software development kit the one that you will use to develop your applications. It provides you the Java methods you need to access all the Android functionality. And finally, the last layer is composed by the Android user application. Applications that again are uh, executed in separate processes. For what concerns the security, each application, as I said before, runs with its own users user and this means that when an application is installed the operating system creates a new user profile uh, associated with it. Okay to be installed an application must contain a special XML file that is called manifest. The, mani the manifest file lists all the components of the application and the permission that uh, your application is asking. So when you install it it will prompt uh, saying this application want to read your personal data, this application want to use your camera. Do you agree? If you say no, the application is not installed. If you say yes, the application is installed. And in the latest version of Android, users can also change permission dynamically. And in any case, you need the user permission for some sensitive hardware features. 
So if you try to use a feature that requires a permission without having it, you will simply receive an exception. Okay, so you should also ask permission to, for example, get data, to read user preferences, contacts, and, and so on. So in order to develop Android applications, we need to install the Android Software de Development Kit. And uh, as mentioned before, uh, it exposes a set of APIs which allows the access to the underlying hardware. And the points to remember are that there is no distinction between native and third-party applications, that you need the user permission to access sensitive hardware and software, that Android already includes a set of minimal applications that you can reuse, and that the main programming language is Java. In general, an application is composed of a set of data and a set of code that together provide some functionality towards the, the user. However, there is a big difference between Android applications and standard ones, for example, Python applications. Standard applications uh, typically have a main function and start for, from a well-defined point. So you write a main method and from there you start creating anything, you define variables, you perform HTTP requests and so on. Android applications do have a main, but you don't need to write it it's already written and such a main only performs a single basic task that is managing components. That's because um, each application is actually a set of components that can be independent from each other but can even communicate to share uh, data and functionality. And it is the operating system and not you that will decide when to instantiate, activate, or destroy such components. In other words, uh, it automatically manages their life cycle. You get informed of what is happening, but you can control uh, the life cycle of the components. So we are moving from uh, a sequential uh, programming language, such as Python, to a more reactive way of uh, programming where we have components and components can react to events and uh, execute codes. So each component is actually a Java class that has a specific life cycle managed by Android. Android informs each component of its life cycle so it can say to the main activity of your application for example, hey I'm going to kill you so that we can save our data before the killing process. Okay, and what are those components? There are four main components. Um, activities, services, content providers, and broadcast receivers. Obviously, you can use all of them or a subset of them. And as we will see later, uh, all the components used in your application must be described in the manifest file. The first component is the activity. An activity is designed for supporting user interaction. So activities do have a user interface and they represent simply the, a window of your application and they are used to perform single self-contained user tasks. So for example, in an email client, there might be an activity for composing emails another activity for reading emails, and so on. So a very interesting feature is that activities of an application and also other components can be reused from other applications. So if you are developing an app and in your app you want to provide users with the possibility of sending emails, you don't need to write a custom client, a custom activity. You can simply say, for example, okay, Android, uh, I'm going to send an email please open the default activity for sending emails. That is probably the, an activity of Gmail, of the Gmail app. And this is extremely powerful because you don't have to develop things that already exist and user can use well-known interfaces such as the one of Gmail. So to summarize, our uh, applications will be composed of one or more activities, one for each user task we model. 
and we will see more on this component later. The second component are services, and they are designed for completing background tasks. So, for example, for downloading things, monitoring user location, and so on. Services don't have any user interface, and they run in the background. A service could be used, for example, to play a song while the user is performing any other type of task, or to make an HTTP request without blocking the user interaction with the, with the application. Then we have content providers that can be used to share data with other applications in a structured way. So for example, from your application, you can ask other applications to give you the list of songs saved on your phone, or maybe the list of contacts saved in your contact list. And finally, we have broadcast receivers. A broadcast receiver is a component which is uh, executed whenever some registered events happen in your, in your operating system. To register uh, an event, you obviously need to declare it in the manifest file. And for example, you may have a broadcast receiver to be executed when your phone starts up or you can monitor the status of the Wi-Fi, so when the Wi-Fi is turned off, you can execute some code with a broadcast receiver. Uh, you can execute a broadcast receiver when the level of your battery is low, and so on. So the life cycle of a broadcast receiver is very short. When the monitored event happens, the broadcast receiver is instantiated and executed, and then it immediately dies. And also broadcast receivers uh, do not have uh, user interfaces, but they can generate notifications in the status bar. So this figure summarize the structure of Android application. Activities are for user interaction. You will typically always use them in your applications. Uh, so activities present a user interface to the user with buttons, list, text fields, and so on. Uh, and when run an activity can perform many tasks, it can take and process the user input, it can call libraries, it can create other objects, uh, it can access databases, and so on. Services instead are for running in the background, so typically they are used to connect the application to the network for requesting, downloading, uh, or uploading information. Broadcast receiver uh, instead intercepts system events, such as events that can be generated by the operating system, uh, but also by the application itself, so by other user applications. And finally, content providers are used to share the data you want of your application to other external applications. So when we create an application, we create as many components as we want, and we provide a manifest file. And as I already told you, the manifest is an XML file, that contains the permissions and the set of, of components offered by our application. So, as we will see, um, the, the developing tool we will use to create Android application named Android Studio will manage most of the information of the manifest file automatically. So when we will create a new activity from the Android Studio menu, it will automatically insert the activity also in the manifest file. So now let's look at the application lifecycle, the process that goes from the user touching the icon of the app on the phone to the actual execution of the app. So when external events like touching the icon happen, uh, Android creates a new process. And before any other things, Android instantiate a special single object named application. And this is the main, let's say the main of your, of your application that will manage all the execution of the components in the application. Um, so once Android has created it, it tells it you have been created. And this is a very important pattern that we will see many times. So all the components and also the, the application object receive events from Android and are able to intercept them uh, from their Java classes. 
So for example, if the application class implements the onCreate method, then the application object is able to react to the you have been created event and to perform some useful operations at startup, for example. So let's say this is the prevailing pattern to program in Android and, the, and it is Android notify me of some external events, my component class intercept such an event through a callback method and inside the callback method I perform the operations I need. Okay. When, once the application object has been created, and most of the time the application object does nothing, then the main activity component, the one corresponding to the first window of your application, is created. And during the instance, uh, instantiation process, sorry, the activity is informed of some events. So, as before, in the onCreate callback, for example, you may create the user interface, you, you set up your window, and so on. And um, then there are other callbacks, for example, when the Android operating system called uh, onStart callback, this means that the activity is started and the user can start interacting with, with the application and so on. We will see some callback uh, in our examples. And then the application, when the main activity is created, uh, remains in this, let's say, interactive state until something happens. For example, uh, until uh, you open a new, a new application on top of, of, your, uh, of your previous one. And so in this case, for example, when you open a new application, the previous application uh, called the onPause method. And you can write code in different uh, points, uh, in different callbacks to execute your, your operations. Typically, it is Android that decides when to kill an application and not you. And so when all the components have been terminated, Android removes the application object. And this is uh, a chart that shows the, the detail of the life cycle of an activity. Okay, the last theoretical concept for today uh, are intents. So to instantiate components, such as uh, starting an activity or a service or a broadcast receiver, Android uses special messages called intents. So for example, when you tap the icon of your app, an intent to start the main activity of your app is sent to the operating system that find the associated component, so the main activity of your, of your application, execute it. You can also use explicit intents from your application in order to, call, to dynamically call components, for example, to open a new, a new activity. And... Uh, Yes. So an intent defines an action to be performed and a set of data on which to operate. And the operating systems finds and instantiates the corresponding components that can handle the, the required action. More in detail, an intent consists of three main parts. The action, which is actually a verb that describes the required action. There are many actions that can be used, like uh, view for opening an activity, send, dial, you can see more on the documentation. The data part is typically a URI that describes the data on which the action needs to be executed. Uh, for example, the activity to be, to be opened. And then there, are, there may be categories, a string that provides details about uh, the action. As I already told you, all the components are listed in the manifest file and each component can have uh, intent filters. That means I'm a special component and I react to this intent. Please send this intent to Android and I will be executed. So if there are um, two components, even of different applications with the same intent filter, 
Android, for example, will ask you which one do you want to use. And this happens, for example, when you have multiple browsers on your phone and you are trying to open a web page. So Android, for example, asks you, uh, do you want to use Chrome or Firefox or so on? So when an intent is delivered, Android tries to match it against all the filters in all the intent filters in the phone in order to detect which component should be activated. And this is a, an example of a manifest file. The manifest first specifies various things about the application, such as its name, the application style, and so on. Then it specifies all the components. In this case, there is a single component, an activity, this one. And as you can see, uh, the activity has an intent filter, this one in red. Um, and it is marked to be the main activity of the application. So the activity that will be executed when we, the intent gener uh, when we click on the icon on our phone. And then we can also have explicit intents. Uh, and we will see an example in our first application to dynamically open, for example, activities uh, via code. OK. So to develop applications, we will use Android Studio. You can download it. It's uh, a very big file, so it takes some time to be installed, uh, but it's very powerful. So I think that the best option for today is to skip the slides and try to start developing uh, our first application. And the goal for today is to create a very simple uh, calculator. No, not this one. This one is <laughs> It's this one, <laughs> OK? Uh, it has a terrible design, but it's OK for our purposes. So uh, we can insert two numbers inside two text box. And we can click one of the four buttons associated with the four uh, operations. So I can click plus, And uh, I can see the result in a separate label. And I can also click on the info button to open a new activity to see some info about this wonderful uh, application. OK? And so this is an example of using uh, an explicit intent. So when I click on the info button, I use an explicit intent to tell Android to open a new activity on top of the previous one. Question? Good. So I open now the Android Studio the Android Studio development kit. OK, to create a new application, I can click on Start a new Android Studio project. Here I can define the application name. Let's call it Wonderful Calculator. The company domain, for example, uh, and this will be also the package name of our classes. Packages are, uh, let's call them uh, directories to organize Java classes. I will use it.polito.ami. I create the application on the on my desktop. It's okay, and I can click next. So here you can select. Uh, we are developing an application for phones, and we can select. Uh, <clears throat> the minimum version uh, to maintain compatibility 
with Android. So as you can see, the last version is Android 9, but it's better to, let's say, target Android 5 to maintain compatibility with older versions of the Android uh, phones. Let's... Okay. I select an empty activity for the moment. And here I can define the name of my main activity. And let's call it main activity. It's good. Next. Okay. Finish. Here we are. This is the folder of our our project, and uh, in the app folder, and in particular in the source main folders, we have two main folders: the Java one and the Res resources one. Uh, this is because uh, typically components that have a user interface such as activities will be divided into two files. Uh, one Java class that contains uh, all the logic of the activity, so the Java code, and one XML file that is the layout of the activity, so the graphical interface of the activity. So the first step is to create a new activity, the main one where we have uh, buttons and so on. So on the project folder, I perform a right click, I click new, no, it's not, on. Uh, 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 uh. Uh, it's already, it's, yes, actually uh, Visual Studio is really uh, slow, so we have to wait some background operations So we will start by creating uh, the first activity that is this one and then we will create the second activity and we will link this activity to the first one and in particular to the callback associated with the click of this button. Ah, okay, obviously um, Android Studio already created the main activity because I specified it in the first uh, setup menu. So as you can see we have the main activity class in the package oops. Okay. We have the main activity Java class that is in the Java folder and we have the activity main.xml that is the layout of the activity that is in the resource folder and in particular in the layout in the layout folder. Okay? So and uh, they are linked with this line of code. So here I'm saying that the activity, the main activity has this layout. So let's start with the layout of the activity. 
we have two options. We can uh, insert uh, components uh, such as buttons, uh, labels, and so on uh, with this uh, graphical user interface, or we can write XML code. So the, th the first thing to do is to define uh, an external layout container and uh, let's delete this one and uh, the basic uh, uh, layout component is the linear layout that is used to place uh, components uh, horizontally or vertically we must sorry let's change this one to linear layout it's better This is a demonstration that the tool is really, really slow. Very, very good. So let's try to Okay, let's start again. Sorry for inconvenience. Android Studio. So let's try again. I open the activity XML file. Waiting. Okay. Let's try again. I change the constraint layout into a linear layout oh, I have to okay so a linear layout and I can define the orientation of the layout and let's put vertical good and inside the layout I can put many different components one by line for example, a text view with the text, for example, welcome. I can also go back to the design tab to see if uh, the layout uh, works. So I have the welcome here. I can modify the text style, for example, 
text style bold, the alignment of the text, center, some padding. Let's go back to the design tab. Okay. Then we have two lines where the first line is uh, for inserting the first number and the second line for inserting uh, the second number. Uh, and so for each line we have two components, a label and uh, an input text. So I define two linear layouts, and, but with a different orientation, an horizontal orientation. And inside the linear layout, I put a label with the text, example number one, and an edit text to insert the first number. So let's go back to the design tab. Okay. I have the first label and the edit text to insert the first number. However, to get the user input, I need also an ID uh, for the edit text so that from the Java code I can get the user input by using the ID of the component. So, Android ID. And let's call it number one. I copy and paste this linear layout for the second number, number two, number two. Go back to the design tab. Okay, we have the two lines with the two numbers. Then I have a line for the four buttons, for the four operations. So another horizontal linear layout with four buttons, a row of four buttons. And the component is named button. I can put a text, for example, the first button is the plus. I copy and paste four buttons and I change the text. Okay, but also in this case I need an ID because uh, I must assign a callback to each button from the Java code. So every time I need uh, to associate or to get data from a button from a text box, I need to assign an ID, so Android ID, let's call uh, plus, minus, oops, times, and Okay. Let's go back to the design tab. Very good. The line with the four buttons. And then the last thing to, to add is um, the result label to display uh, the result of the operation. Uh, so let's add another linear layout with horizontal orientation, with the two components, a label, so a text view, with the text result, and another label that will be automatically, dynamically uh, filled by the, via the Java code. And also in this case, I need an ID, obviously. ID, result. So 
So we have a basic layout. Then we will add also the button to open the new activity. But let's start with the first operations. I can open the Java class that is in the Java folder, main activity. And here I can define the callbacks uh, that I need. So I need to get the data from the two edit text. So I need a reference to the two edit text. Let's define the first reference, edit text number one and edit text number two. Then I need a reference for each button to associate a callback. So button class, let's import the class, button minus, button times and button division. And then I need also a reference to the result label. So text view result. These are only variables and to get a reference I can use the find view by ID function. And here I have um, I have to specify the ID of each component. So I can use the R that is a built-in class to get all the to get all the IDs of my application. So r.id dot number one to get a reference of the number one text view and uh, to associate that reference to the number one variable. I can do the same for the number two. And for all the buttons, plus equals two. plus minus. Let's copy the function r dot id dot minus times. division and also for the result text view. Okay, now we have all the references to the uh, graphical user interface and we can assign callbacks. So, we need a callback for each button. Let's start with the, uh, the plus one. And to assign callbacks, I can use the uh, plus dot set on click listener. This is the callback for the click event on the button. Set on click listener, and I have to define a new on click listener. And this is the method that will be executed every time I will click on the plus button, right? So what are the operations to be performed here in the onClick method? Okay, so we need to get the first number that will be probably an integer and one equals two I have a reference to the number one uh, text view number one dot get text unfortunately the get text is uh, uh, returns a string so we need to convert the string into a number integer dot parseint
we can do the same for the second number and two then we can perform the operation and finally I can set the text of the result with the result so set text sum right so what happens if I insert the chart yeah yes yes of course uh, and now what happens if I insert uh, a character in the edit text? For example, uh, uh, the letter E. What happens? Yeah, we receive an exception because we are trying to parse a character as a number, a letter as a number. So to check the user, we need also to check the user input, input, for example, by using a try-catch block. So number format exception. So I try to parse the two uh, numbers, the two uh, values extracted from the edit text, and if I receive a number format exception, this means that the user has, for, has, for example, inserted uh, a letter, and I can generate an error message, for example, and I can use the toast class, toast dot make text. I have to specify the context of my application that I can get from the get application context the function. The message you must insert numbers and the length of the message and I show the message. and then I exit the method. I cannot continue to perform the operation if the two variables are not numbers. I have to define the two variables outside the try-catch block If I don't receive any exception, I can calculate the, uh, the result and I can set the result text view. Any questions? Let's, let's try the application. So you can try the application in two ways. You can use uh, uh, emulators from the Android uh, software development kit, uh, but also the emulator is really, really slow and you can also use obviously your phone and to use the phone now I use an application to mirror the screen of my phone <coughs> to use your phone you must connect it to a USB cable and you also need to activate the developer settings in your phone that are by default hidden but you can enable the developer options typically by clicking multiple times on the build number field of your settings so if you click multiple times in your build, uh, build number, so here I am already a developer, but you can enable the developer options. And then in the developer options, uh, 
you can enable the USB debugging to install application via USB from the Android Studio to your phone. So let's try to install the application. Run, run. doesn't work because so let's try to close the mirroring up I don't know why. Ah, okay. I disabled the USB debugging. Let's try again, otherwise we will use the emulator. No, it doesn't work. I will try to fix this for the next lesson. We cannot try now the application, so let's start. Let's continue to write the code and then the next lesson we will try the application on the phone. Uh, okay, I defined the on click listener for the plus, and I can do the same simply by copying and pasting the code for all the other buttons. Minus, obviously here I need to change the operation. Times. And division. Here I could also perform uh, another check on the user input for avoiding, for example, division by zero. So I can add uh, an input check. If n2 is equals to zero, I generate another uh, message error. OK. So now we can add the last part of the application and in particular a button here to open a new activity. We can add some text to the button info. Obviously also in this case I need an ID info. Then from the main activity, I get the reference to the info button, info equals to find view by id, r.id.info, uh, let's check the id, yes, it's info, okay. And here I can set up a non-click listener 
to open a new activity. And to open a new activity, uh, obviously I need to create a new activity. So in the uh, project folder, I can right click and I can select new activity, an empty activity. I call it info activity. As you can see, uh, Android Studio automatically inserted into the manifest file the new activity we created, the info activity. This is the main activity with the intent filter main. Good. And here to open the activity, I need to create an intent, an explicit intent. Uh, and to import it, I have to specify the application context and also the activity I would like to open. So info activity dot class and then I can use the start activity method by using the intent so here we are, we are sending this intent to Android by requesting the opening of the info activity uh, window and obviously we can modify the, the activity with a linear layout, for example, a label with some text. I am Alberto. And we can also insert some uh, images already downloaded my wonderful profile picture it is here uh, I can copy the image typically static files such as images um, can be stored in the resource folder and for images for example in the drawable folders so I pass the image in the drawable folder pass 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 okay Okay, and now we can insert maybe today nothing works, so activity info. I don't know. Now I cannot write anything. Really cool. So I can use. No, it doesn't work anymore. Sorry. I can use an image that is inside this one image view. Okay. And I can select the me file. Okay. Obviously, I can change uh, the dimension of this image. I can align it uh, to the bottom, to the top, and so on. And so forth. But this is the main concept. I create an intent and I pass it to Android with the start activity the start activity function so let's try if I can try to restart Android Studio otherwise we will try it in the following lesson Android Calculator
No. Today is a bad day. Okay, it doesn't work. We will try next time. Uh, however, the application is finished. And I will put it in, inside the tab. Any questions? The next time we will try to develop some more complex uh, examples. We will try to develop the to-do list with a REST server and we will try to perform some, some HTTP requests to the REST server to get, the, to get and display the list of, uh, of things to do from our to-do list. Okay? Thank you for your attention and you can now go into in Ladispe for the supervised work group. Per quanto riguarda l'uso della libreria di Java, lui consiglia qualche riferimento in particolare su cui studiare come usarle o in rete possiamo trovare? Libreria cosa intendi? Cioè per, per fare l'app, per, ah, cioè per la imparare Java? La parte di XM, no, sì, non per imparare il Java, per, visto che cioè, usa, una, usa una, un package impostato da... se non sbaglio. Beh, ma... quello viene eh, gratis con... cioè è, è Android standard, intendi... Quale? Eh, ok, tutte quelle cose lì eh, dovremmo imparare. Queste cose qua vengono gratis, con Android, cioè fanno parte dell'ecosistema Android di base. Okay, e, cioè, Quindi, eh, come vedi qua, c'è la libreria di, dei widget, ma è interna ad Android Studio. Sì, sì, voglio dire, cioè, poi per usarla nelle nostre app... Eh, cioè, allora, beh, sicuramente eh, come ho detto all'inizio c'è la libreria, c'è la documentazione online dove trovi qualunque cosa. Eh, fammi solo vedere di aver stoppato la video registrazione, se no.